there was a young woman who wasn't really sure that she believed in God. A colleague of mine who posted on a Facebook page for ELCA clergy wrote this early this past week, Resurrection, meh. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship on the second Sunday of Easter. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. The joy and peace of God be with you all. And also with you. Almighty and gracious God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith in you and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now we pray. Good morning, you guys. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> so, um, there is a, a story that goes kind of like this. Um, there was a young woman who wasn't really sure that she believed in God. Um, wasn't really sure about all of this. But she was friends with a woman uh, named Mrs. Goldberg. And Mrs. Goldberg knew God very well and believed in God. And, and Mrs. Goldberg would go every weekend to worship at the synagogue. And so this young woman, would go with Mrs. Goldberg every single weekend. There was Mrs. Goldberg, and there was a young friend sitting next to her. And finally, one weekend, um, the rabbi, the, the leader of the, the worshiping community, the synagogue, came to the young woman and said, now I know that you don't believe in God, so why is it that you show up here every single weekend for worship? And the young woman said, I know it's exciting, isn't it? So exciting you can chew a motorcycle. Exactly. I, I feel that way sometimes too. So the, the rabbi asked the woman, so why, why do you come here all the time? Because we're here worshiping God and you don't believe in God. Why, why are you here? And the young woman said, well, I don't really talk with God. But Mrs. Goldberg talks with God. And I really admire Mrs. Goldberg. So I talk with Mrs. Goldberg which is a wonderful kind of connection, because today we're going to hear a story about a guy named Thomas, uh, who is one of Jesus' first followers, his friends. And last Sunday, you guys may remember, we heard that Jesus rose from the dead in, in a new way. He came to life. Death couldn't hold him down. He came to life in a new way. Um, but it was surprising. People didn't really know what to make of it. Um, and uh, Mary Magdalene, one of his friends, actually saw Jesus in person. She came back and told everybody else, I have seen Jesus, he's alive. And they're like, mm, really? So they didn't believe her. But then Jesus, we're going to hear, shows up to them and says, hey, look, it's me. I, I really is me. But Thomas wasn't there. So they tell Thomas, same thing Mary told them, we saw Jesus. And Thomas was like, mm, I don't know. I want to see for myself. And so the next weekend, Jesus comes back and shows himself to Thomas. Thomas says, there to look, Thomas, it's me. And Thomas says, oh, that's amazing. You are so amazing. You are basically God as a human. That is so amazing. And Jesus says, Tom, good for you. That's wonderful. I'm so glad that you believe. Even better, there are going to be other people who won't get to see me the same way you do, but they will also believe. And that is an amazing thing. Kind of like that young woman who didn't know God but knew Mrs. Goldberg and believed in the God of Mrs. Goldberg even though she didn't believe for herself. And that's kind of the gift that we have. We don't all get to see exactly what we want to see. We don't get to see God the way we want to see God. But you know what? There are all kinds of people around here who have met God and who believe in God and who are living out as best they can the kind of life that they want to. Some of them some of them even live in your house. They do. So, 
We have that gift that even when we struggle with our own doubts, our own questions, which is good. God is a big fan of questions. Because how do we learn if we don't have questions, right? God is a big fan of questions. And we get to live with our own Mrs. Goldbergs. So even when we don't know how to talk to God, we can talk to Josh's. I mean to Mrs. Goldbergs. Amen. Thanks for being here, you guys. First reading is found in the book to Acts, second chapter. Uh, we'll start with the 14th verse as a beginning and then go from verses 22 to 32. It was after the Holy Spirit comes to the apostles on Pentecost. That's 50 days after Easter. Penta, 50. Uh, Peter preaches the gospel to a gathering crowd. And he tells them that Jesus, who obediently went to his death according to God's plan, was raised from the dead by God. And finally, he appears in the scripture, in the, uh, quoting uh, Psalm 16, Numbers 8 through 11, to show that Jesus is the Messiah, though crucified. The risen Jesus is now enthroned. Beginning with 14. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know. This man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, that's King David, his ancestor. I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my, floor, my flesh will live in hope. <coughs> For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him that he would, be, that he would put one of his descendants on the throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and that all of us are witnesses. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Now, this, today's second reading is found in 1 Peter, first chapter, beginning with the third verse. Now, Now, this epistle was written to encourage Christians experiencing hardships and suffering because of their faith in Christ. And this letter opens by blessing God for the living hope we have through Christ's resurrection, even amid different circumstances and surroundings. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if for now, in a little while you have to have to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith 
being more precious than gold that, though perishable, is tested by fire. And this may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you have, do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. For the word in scripture, for the word among us, for the word within us, thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O God. So this Sunday story picks up immediately after the Easter story that we heard at least at the, the second service last Sunday. So uh, that's the one where Mary Magdalene goes alone first thing in the morning to the tomb, gets there, tomb is emptied, no body inside, she freaks out, runs back, tells the male disciples, two of them come back with her, competing, you know, racing, because that's what boys do. Um, they look in, they see no body, they see the grave close there, they leave, she stays, she sees angels say, where is the body? Um, they say, he's raised, he's not here. She turns around, oh, look, there's the gardener. And uh, if, if you've got the body, please tell me. The gardener says, Mary. And she says, oh, my Lord, you're not the gardener, you're, you're my Lord Jesus. And he says, don't hold on to me. Uh, I've got uh, places to go, things to do, but go tell the boys that I am risen and uh, returning to my father and their father. She goes back, she says, I have seen the Lord. And we pick up. When it was the evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Judeans, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. A colleague of mine who posted on a, a Facebook page for ELCA clergy wrote this early this past week, Resurrection, meh. She wrote, Jesus gives abundant life. Because he lives, we live. Jesus destroyed death. Jesus is always with us. Why does it matter? She pointed out, she looks around at, at, at the world that we still live in, and it doesn't look all that resurrected. 
It looks like there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of cruelty, there's a lot of suffering, there's a lot of bad things happening to good people. Resurrection men, what does it matter? It's a good question. It's an important question. It's a worthy question. And fortunately for us, God encourages questions. God says, yes, come to me with those. Let me know what is on your heart and mind so that we can be in dialogue together, so I can, I can address what is on your heart and what is troubling you. So those are good questions, not bad questions to come from uh, a clergy. They're good questions. Probably she's not the only one who has them. There is a uh, seminary, uh, an ELCA seminary professor by the name of Mark Allen Powell, who uh, produced a resource, How Lutherans Read the Bible. A lot of good uh, gems in there, but one of them that I come back to often is, uh, he says, I believe that we have exactly the Bible God wants us to have, which means that if we are struggling with parts of it, that maybe God wants us to struggle. And that's a gift. That it's not, the Bible isn't just about, here's some answer books. It's not like you, oh boy, this is hard one. Where's, where's the index? Do I go to the back and find the answer? Was it, was it B or C for that one? Because I want to get a good grade on my Bible. It's not about that. It's about struggling sometimes. It's about being in dialogue with God and with one another together. What, what does that mean? What do you think? How do you see that in your life? How do we make sense of this together as a people? Perhaps we have exactly what God wants us to have. So why does it matter? Why does, why does resurrection matter? Good question. I'm not sure I can promise you a satisfying answer, but I'd love to dive into working on the question together for just a little bit. There are three things in particular that really strike me in this particular resurrection story as being important. One is peace. Peace seems to be really important. Jesus, who, remember, he's coming back to people who abandoned him, who neglected him, who pretended they didn't even know him, and he comes to them, and the first thing he says to them is, peace be with you. And then he says it again once they recognize, oh, it's Jesus. It's not just some ghost. It's not some weirdo who broke in. It's Jesus. He says again, peace be with you. And then a week later, when Thomas is there, peace be with you. And this, is, this isn't just a, hey, how you doing, peace, man? Good to see you. Hope, hope you had a good week. I haven't seen you for a while. It's not just that. It's much deeper. It's much fuller. The, um, the, 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 the Greek word is irene, and it comes from the Hebrew word shalom. And both of those uh, mean not just a lack of conflict, like let's get along. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. It's not that. It is peace with justice. Peace through justice. Peace that is shaped by justice, by righteousness, by fairness, by equity. This is what he, he doesn't just say, well, I hope that you can find that someday. I hope you, no, I give it to you. You have it. I give you my peace. Peace like the world does not know. I give it to you. And knowing Jesus is not just for us to hold on to. It's peace that is not just to come to us, but peace that is to come through us for the rest of the world. It is work. It is a calling. It is a vocation. It is a task. It is holy and blessed work. Peace is given to us and through us for the sake of the world to stand up and, and rock the boat a little bit, to, to make waves a little bit in order to bring peace with justice where there is no peace with justice. To stand up and say, hey, the world is not the way it should be, not the way that God wants it to be, and we're not just going to be quiet about it. We're going to speak up and say, this is not okay. We need to work and speak together for equity. We need to work against racism, against sexism, against transphobia, against xenophobia, against all of these things that are diminishing our neighbors around us and those who are part of our community. To say, we're, this is not what God wants. God doesn't want us picking on people and diminishing people. God wants us to be working for peace with justice, peace with equity, peace with fullness and wholeness for all people. We have work to do. It is blessed and holy work. And, and sometimes there, there are questions about exactly what that work is in, in the... Uh, toward the end of this passage that we just hear, Jesus says to them what he, what he wants them uh, to do. And years ago, I had the, the blessing of being at a, a John workshop with uh, Reverend Susan Briel, 
who talks about this one particular verse where uh, most of the translations that we have today is, Jesus says, here's the job I want you to do. Um, uh, if you forgive the sins of anybody, those sins are forgiven. But if you retain the sins of anybody, those sins are retained. But Susan Real, Pastor Susan Real pointed out the original Greek, if you, if you look at it the way it is, that, that, that may not be the best way to, to phrase it, to, to interpret it. Because in what I just read to you, the word sins appears twice. We forgive them or we retain them. But only once in, in the original Greek. The original Greek says, if you release anyone, they are released. If you release the sins of anyone, they are released. If you hold on to anyone, they are held on to. That's a different job. So that, that first word, that forgive sins, it, it's, uh, again, the, the Greek word is afete. It literally means release. It's the exact same thing a week before he died that Jesus, when he was raising Lazarus, said, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus comes out. He's all bound up with bandages. And Jesus says to the community, hey, go help out poor Lazarus there. Unbind him and afete him, release him. So what the people did for Lazarus to release him so that he could be free and live fully is exactly what he says is our job for everybody. Release them from what is binding them, from what is holding them back, release them. And then that second uh, thing that they are to do, the Greek word is katete, uh, means grasp, hold on to them. And I love this as a job for us that we have two things uh, to do in the world that, that are related to this, this peace with justice thing, is we need to release people who are bound, and we need to hold on to people who feel like they don't belong. Because don't we all know people who are struggling to feel like, the church, I'm done with it. I've seen what church out there does, and I want nothing to do with it, and I don't know that I want anything to do with your particular God either. And we don't just say, well, I guess they're going to hell. <laughs> no! No, we say we hold on to you. You belong to us and you belong to our God whether or not you want her because she wants you and loves you. This is good work, people. This is wonderful work to bring peace with justice, to release people from what holds them back and to hold on to them no matter what. A second thing about this story is that Jesus shows up embodied and scarred. Now, there's a lot of weirdness about the risen Jesus. People have trouble recognizing him. Is that because he looks different? Is that because we're not expecting him? Is it because it's not what we're looking for and he's right there but we don't see him? I don't know. He does things that our bodies normally don't do. He just shows up through locked rooms. And yet, he, he is embodied. And that seems to be important. He's not just a spirit who has been freed from all of this horrible, you know, material, fleshy stuff. No, God loves the world. God created things and said, these are good things. I like them. I love these things I made. And still does, even after dying and being resurrected, coming into a new form of life, God still adores the things that God has made. And so Jesus comes back and is still embodied. And as far as we know, is still embodied. That blows my mind somewhere, if there is a where that he is, in the universe is an embodied Jesus. Perhaps still with scars. And that is the other thing. He makes a point of that. It, is it just to say, yep, yeah, it's me. Remember the guy who was hanging on the cross when you ran away? Remember that? That's me. It could just be that, but it could also be, hey, don't hide the scars. Don't hide from the scars. They are part of who we are. And you are now to be my body in the world. I'm sending you out to be the body, the hands with which I serve, the voice with which I speak, the ears with which I hear, the heart with which I love. You are my body. And you know what? My body is scarred. My body has issues. There are some of you who are soldiers with PTSD. There are some of you who are teachers and students with PTSD from violence, where you work and learn. There are youth with scars on their bodies from cutting themselves in order to control the pain in their minds, in their hearts. There are friends and family of ours who have needle marks on their bodies from trying to deal with the, the depression and the anxiety in their hearts and minds. We are 
a broken people. The body of Christ has scars on it still today. And we don't have to hide from that. We don't have to deny that. We can say, look, we are a scarred body. We are broken and blessed. And then finally, the third thing that I would particularly focus on is that we are spirited. That's another thing that seems important to Jesus when he comes back to his disciples is he breathes his spirit into them. This, again, has these wonderful echoes because that one of the creation stories from the very beginning was God made all these good things and then said, hey, I want to make a human. And he scoops up some mud and he makes a little muddling. He says, oh, look at the cute little muddling. But it doesn't do much. I know what it needs. It needs ruach. It needs my breath, my spirit. And breathes it into the muddling. And then the muddling is a human. And it has life. And it makes choices. And it does things. And it interacts. And that's what Jesus does here. Breathes that into the disciples. And we just heard a few weeks ago about the story of Ezekiel, the prophet, looking out at the people who are in... Um, have been taken away uh, into exile, and they feel like they're dead as a, as a community, as, as a people. And God says to them, hey, I'm going to raise them up. Those, see those bones? I'm going to put flesh on those bones and skin on that flesh, and they're going to rise. And then uh, there they are standing, but they're not doing anything. And God says to Ezekiel, call upon the ruach, the breath, the wind. And it comes into them, and they are alive again as a people, not just as individuals. And that's what Jesus does to the disciples breathes that spirit into them so that in order to do this difficult and amazing work we've been given to do, we have within us a power that is beyond our own. We have the power of God in and with us and through us for the sake of the world. That's pretty exciting stuff. Resurrection, men, why does it matter? It's a good question. It's a worthy question, and sometimes we are deep in despair, and we look around and we see the world does not look all that great. Why does it matter that Jesus was resurrected? Well, part of it is that we are in this together, not just on our own. You're not off on your own trying to force yourself to be joyful about resurrection. There may be times where you can't be, where you are so much, maybe that's where my colleague is. She's looking around and she is overwhelmed by the pain of the world, and that's okay. That's why we do this together. That's why all of these verbs we have here are y'alls, not just yous. He's speaking to all y'all, to us as a community. One of the stories I love about Martin Luther, uh, late in life, he, he uh, married Katarina, and they had some children together, his daughter Magdalena, he adored Magdalena. And when she was 13 years old, she died in his arms. His 13-year-old child died in his arms. And a friend of his wrote to him and said, well, Martin, at least you have your faith to sustain you. And Martin wrote back something to the effect, now right now I don't, I don't, I'm too broken. I am too, too torn up by the uh, pain and sorrow I'm going through. You will have to believe for me until my faith revives on my own. That's part of what we do for each other. We hold the faith together for each other. That's why we baptize little babies. Don't ask that little baby, can you recite the Apostles' Creed? We don't do that. We know the Apostles' Creed on behalf of her. We believe for her and with her until she grows into that faith. It is a community. And this community allows people to be where they are in their despair, but doesn't leave them alone, gathers around, connects with people, cares for them, lets them know they are loved in spite of how horrible things are around them. Resurrection life means that we are blessed to do the work of God's peace with justice. God's resurrection means that we are people who are scarred and embodied and blessed. Resurrection means that we are spirited with a power beyond our own for the sake of the world. Resurrection, why does it matter? Because of resurrection, we are scarred and inspirited to embody and bear God's peace with justice for everyone. That's why it matters. Amen. The breath of the Spirit and the peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share that peace with one another. Peace be with you.
Have you ever noticed in your own thought patterns, now this isn't highly philosophical, theological at all, you just observe your own mind. And if there is something negative or problematic, you will wrap around that immediately. Watch yourself. You can have even a moment of great joy and it's hard to wrap around. It's hard to sustain happiness. It really is. You have to work. You have to choose. You have to clear away the garbage to sustain honeymoons and moments of happiness. They, they, they run away for some terrible reason. It's almost diabolical. I mean that. We're attracted to the negative. I'd rather hold on to victimhood than... Yeah, yeah. Joy is not easily sustained. We lose it in a moment. It, it, so that's, I'm making the connection with resurrection. That resurrection has to be uh, not just surrendered to, but has to be recognized as such. I'm feeling really content and full right now. How can I deeply say yes to that, you know, and allow that? Now, now I admit there are some people who want to sustain it at a superficial level, which becomes addiction. And we're not talking about addiction. But resurrection is not our natural state. It's always a gift from God, but a gift from God that we have to assent to and choose and make our own. You don't have to believe anything. You just watch your own mind. And you're doing this every day, and I'm doing this every day, avoiding resurrection and choosing hell. I'm gonna, <laughs> yeah. And when you think the, the, the negative commentaries that people write nonstop, for years on end about their first wife or their <laughs> the job they lost or they they really do dig a pit for themselves that pretty soon it's dug so deep and now we know this is even true physiologically that that the neural grooves that you overuse become myelinated defined strengthened and the ones you don't use die this can be proven. If you never go to the neural groove of mercy, never. I don't practice mercy. <laughs> By the time you're my age, you don't know how to be merciful anymore. That's why most old people are, as we say, set in their ways, not much fun to be around, if they've only kept affirming the same obsessive. See, most thinking is obsessive thinking. It, it took my contemplative practice to recognize that in myself, but then to help other people recognize it in themselves. That if you watch, you tend to think the same thing over and over and over again. It's, <laughs> why? What good is it after a while? So unless you jump out of that neural groove that you've over-practiced, now that's what you're doing in contemplation. You have the temptation to the resentful thought from the guy who did me in yesterday. All right, okay. You can go back to that, but you've thought it once. <laughs> you've felt it through once. You really don't need to practice feeling resentment toward him for another 24 hours. You're doing yourself a favor, and you're doing the universe a favor to move to another response and say, as my father Francis taught us, that those you think are your enemies are your greatest friends because they're going to teach you exactly this <laughs> that you don't know how to love yet that you're not in christ in love you're in resentment is what you are and when you're in resentment you're not in christ you're, the two can't coexist so it you see how i keep bringing it back to some kind of necessary meditation contemplative practice because otherwise People don't see these things. And ministers get up before huge congregations and preach an entire sermon on a good scripture, but out of a resentful mindset. It's largely not just a waste of time, but destructive.
the blessing. Almighty God, fill us with joy. Renew the risen life of Christ within us and bring us forth in an abundance, bring forth in us an abundance of the fruits of the Holy Spirit for the sake of the world. Amen. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace, scarred and spirited to embody and bear God's peace with justice and serve the Lord. By the presence and power of God,